One day, a boy was digging in his garden when he saw a big toe sticking out of the ground. He tried to pick it up, but it was stuck. It wouldn't budge, so he pulled as hard as he could and it came off in his hand. Then he heard something groan and scampered away. The boy took the big toe into the kitchen and showed it to his mom. That looks like a nice piece of meat, she said. I'll put it in the soup and we'll have it for dinner. That night at the dinner table, the boy's father scooped the big toe out of the soup and chopped it up into three pieces. The father, the mother, and the boy each ate a piece. Then they did the dishes, and when it got dark, they went to bed. The boy fell asleep almost at once, but in the middle of the night, he was rudely awakened by a strange sound. He listened closely. It sounded like there was a voice coming from outside his window, and it was calling to him. Where is my big toe? It groaned. When the boy heard that, he got very scared. But he thought, it doesn't know where I am. It will never find me. Then he heard the voice once more, only now it was closer. Where is my big toe? It groaned. The boy pulled the blankets over his head and closed his eyes. I'll go to sleep, he thought. When I wake up, it will be gone. But soon he heard the back door open, and again he heard the voice. Where is my big toe? It groaned. Then the boy heard footsteps move through the kitchen, into the dining room, into the living room, into the front hall. They slowly climbed the stairs. Closer and closer they came. Soon they were in the upstairs hall. Outside his door. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. The boy watched in horror as his bedroom door opened. Shaking with fear, he threw his bedclothes over his head and listened as the footsteps slowly moved through the dark towards his bed. Then they stopped. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. You've got it! Bill whistled as he strolled through the park. He was on his way to meet his girlfriend, Sally. He could smell spring in the air. He jingled the engagement ring in his pocket and thought about asking Sally to marry him. Sally sat down on a park bench and Bill kneeled down in front of her. Sally, Bill said, you are the most beautiful girl I've ever met. I love you and I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? Sally laughed and said, Yes, I will marry you. As Bill gazed lovingly at his bride-to-be, his eyes lingered on the red velvet ribbon Sally always wore around her neck. Why do you always wear that red ribbon? Bill asked. Sally said, Bill, I must never take off my red ribbon. Bill smiled at Sally and left the ribbon alone. Bill and Sally were married that June. Bill found a lovely little house in a nice neighborhood and they moved in. Bill bought Sally many party dresses, but Sally always wore her red ribbon with each outfit. Bill thought this was odd. Sally just smiled and said, I must never take off my red ribbon. After a few years, Sally found out she was going to have a baby. This news delighted Bill. Sally talked with her friends who had babies. Bill talked with his buddies who had children. They talked together late into the night about what they had learned from everyone. When the big day came, Sally said, Please tell the doctor I must not take off my red ribbon. Bill was frustrated, but he promised Sally that he would tell the doctor. After the baby was born, Bill gave Sally flowers. Thank you for the flowers, Bill, Sally said, and thank you for telling the doctor I must not take off my red ribbon. Bill did not understand why the red ribbon was so important. Do you want to hold little Billy? Sally asked. Bill, Sally, and little Billy lived happily for many years in the small, lovely house in the nice neighborhood. When little Billy was a baby, he would sometimes reach for the red ribbon around his mother's neck. Sally would gently take his little hands in hers and coo at him, saying, Mommy must never, ever take off her red ribbon. The red ribbon had frustrated Bill for a long time. 
He loved Sally with all of his heart, but did not understand her need to wear the red ribbon. After many years, Bill had an idea. Our anniversary is coming up. I will buy Sally a beautiful necklace. She will take off that old red ribbon so she can wear the beautiful necklace. Their anniversary came. Bill took Sally to a fancy restaurant overlooking Central Park. They had a delicious meal. Then, Bill gave Sally a velvet box with a beautiful diamond necklace in it. She opened it, smiled, and tears came to her eyes. Bill put the necklace around her neck and started to take off the red ribbon. Sally stopped him. She said, I must never take off my red ribbon. Bill sat back in his seat with a huff. He looked at Sally and shook his head. I may never understand, Bill said. Sally gently placed the diamond necklace back in the velvet box and closed the lid. It is lovely, Bill. I will treasure it always, she said. But I must never take off my red ribbon. Why? Bill asked, as he had for so many years. Sally smiled sadly and shook her head. She did not answer him. Late that night, Bill was still awake. I've loved Sally for more than 20 years, but she insists on wearing that horrible red ribbon around her neck. I think it's about time I found out why. Bill got out of bed and walked around to Sally's side. Bill carefully pinched the ends of the bow on the ribbon. He began to slowly pull on the ribbon. The bow became smaller and smaller. The loops of the bow pulled through, and only a half knot was left. Bill slid his finger under the half knot and tugged. Zip! The red ribbon gave way. Pop! Sally's head came off. It rolled right to the floor, bouncing in the moonlight. One large tear fell from Sally's eye. I warned you, she said. There was an old farmer in Arizona who owned the best farm in the area. Everybody said his crops were the best people came from all over to buy their goods from him. Whenever people asked him how he was able to grow such good quality crops, the old farmer would say it was all down to a scarecrow. That old scarecrow is the one I have to thank, said the farmer. He makes sure no crows or critters or pests come near my crops. The old farmer had built the scarecrow himself and it was a fearsome sight. He spent months working on it to make it as scary as possible. He knew how important it was to keep pests away from his crops, so he gave it enormous straw arms that stretched out about six feet, and big, long legs that made it as tall as a tree. But the scariest thing about the scarecrow was its head. The farmer carved it himself out of a huge pumpkin. He spent countless days and nights perfecting his design until it was perfect. The scarecrow's face and head was so grotesque and ugly that even he was sometimes scared to look at it. But it was very effective, scaring away every rodent and bird that ventured near. The neighboring farm was owned by two young men who were brothers named Josh and Harold. They were lazy and never did much work around the farm, which resulted in their crops being bad. They were jealous of the old farmer's success and were plotting against him. If they could drive him out of business, they could take over his farm and make more money. So one night, the brothers decided to sneak onto the old farmer's land. They stole his prized scarecrow and brought it back to their house, where they stuffed it into an old closet so nobody would ever find it. The next day, the farmer woke up to find his hideous scarecrow missing, and all his crops being eaten by rats and crows. He fell to his knees and cried, knowing that his farm would soon be out of business. Meanwhile, the brothers Josh and Harold were watching from their own property and couldn't help laughing out loud when they saw the old man's tears of grief. Hearing the laughter, the old farmer came over and asked them if they knew what happened to his scarecrow. The brothers looked him right in the eye and said they had no idea where his precious scarecrow might be. But you know, I'll go out of business and, and have to sell my farm if I can't find my scarecrow, said the farmer. Josh just laughed in his face saying, that there's tough luck, isn't it? 
Sucks to be you, giggled Harold. The old farmer walked slowly back to his house, his head hanging down in defeated depression. That night, as Josh and Harold had trouble sleeping, not because they felt remorse, but because they couldn't get the image of the scarecrow's horribly twisted face out of their minds. They decided they would never be able to sleep as long as that ugly pumpkin head was in their house. So they got up and dragged the scarecrow out of the closet. Harold took a baseball bat and smashed the scarecrow's head to pieces until all that was left was little bits of pumpkin strewn around the floor. The brothers swept up the pumpkin head pieces and threw them in the trash. Then they went back to bed and were soon fast asleep having put all thoughts of the disgusting scarecrow's face out of their heads. Sometime after midnight, Josh and Harold were awoken by the sounds of scratching and clawing at their bedroom door. Did, did you forget to put the dog out? asked Harold sleepily. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't have a dog, stammered Josh. Suddenly, the bedroom door burst open in a solitary long straw arm snaked in through the opening then a second arm thrashed around followed by two long stick legs the brothers were frozen in fear and could only look with horror as the headless scarecrow's body rose up on its long stick legs its long arms reached out for them in the darkness Harold felt a cold sinewy straw claw close around his ankle and screamed as loud as he could he begged his brother Josh to help him, but Josh was already running out of the room. Fleeing in terror, he ran down the hallway, crashed through the front door and out into the moonlit road. He ran as fast as his legs could carry him, puffing and panting and screaming at the top of his voice. As he passed his neighbor's house, he saw the old farmer standing at his gate. In the moonlight, he could see the farmer just staring at him, with a strange smile on his face. Josh kept running, his bare feet slapping against the rough gravel road. He glanced back over his shoulder and saw something that scared him to his very soul. He saw the scarecrow running along the road close behind him. It was gaining on him, coming closer and closer. And that wasn't all he saw. He noticed that the scarecrow had a brand new head, and it looked a lot like Harold. To S.L. Apropos of sleep, that sinister adventure of all our nights, we may say that men go to bed daily with an audacity that would be incomprehensible if we did not know that it is the result of ignorance of the danger. Baudelaire. May the merciful gods, if indeed there be such, guard those hours when no power of the will or drug that the cunning of man devises can keep me from the chasm of sleep. Death is merciful, for there is no return therefrom, but with him who has come back out of the nethermost chambers of night, haggard and knowing, peace rests nevermore. Fool that I was to plunge with such unsanctioned frenzy into mysteries no man was meant to penetrate, fool or god that he was, my only friend, who led me and went before me, and who in the end passed into terrors, which may yet be mine. We met, I recall, in a railway station, where he was the centre of a crowd of the vulgarly curious. He was unconscious, having fallen in a kind of convulsion, which imparted to his slight black-clad body a strange rigidity. I think he was then approaching forty years of age, for there were deep lines in the face wan and hollow-cheeked, but oval and actually beautiful, and touches of grey in the thick waving hair and small full beard which had once been of the deepest raven black. His brow was white as the marble of Penticulus, and of a height and breadth almost godlike. I said to myself, with all the ardour of a sculptor, that this man was a fawn statue out of antique Hellas, dug from a temple's ruins and brought somehow to life in our stifling age only to feel the chill and pressure of devastating years. And when he opened his immense, 
sunken in wildly luminous black eyes. I knew he would be, thenceforth, my only friend. The only friend of one who had never possessed a friend before. For I saw that such eyes must have looked fully upon the grandeur and the terror of realms beyond normal consciousness and reality. Realms which I had cherished in fancy, but vainly sought. So as I drove the crowd away, I told him he must come home with me and be my teacher and leader in unfathomed mysteries, and he assented without speaking a word. Afterward, I found that his voice was music, the music of deep veals and of crystalline spheres. We talked often in the night and in the day, when I chiseled busts of him and carved miniature heads in ivory to immortalize his different expressions. Of our studies, it is impossible to speak, since they held so slight a connection with anything of the world as living men conceive it. They were of that vaster and more appalling universe of dim entity and consciousness which lies deeper than matter, time, and space, and whose existence we suspect only in certain forms of sleep, those rare dreams beyond dreams, which come never to common men, and but once or twice in the lifetime of imaginative men. The cosmos of our waking knowledge, born from such an universe as a bubble is born from the pipe of a jester, touches it only as such a bubble may touch its sardonic source when sucked back by the jester's whim. Men of learning suspect it little and ignore it mostly. Wise men have interpreted dreams, and the gods have laughed. One man with oriental eyes has said that all time and space are relative, and men have laughed. But even that man with oriental eyes has done no more than suspect. I had wished and tried to do more than suspect, and my friend had tried and partly succeeded. Then we both tried together, and with exotic drugs, courted terrible and forbidden dreams in the tower studio chamber of the old manor house in Hoary Kent. Among the agonies of these after days is that chief of torments, inarticulateness. What I learned and saw in those hours of impious exploration can never be told for want of symbols or suggestions in any language. I say this because from first to last our discoveries partook only of the nature of sensations, sensations correlated with no impression which the nervous system of normal humanity is capable of receiving. They were sensations, yet within them lay unbelievable elements of time and space, things which at bottom possessed no distinct and definite existence. Human utterance can best convey the general character of our experiences by calling them plungings or soarings, for in every period of revelation some part of our minds broke boldly away from all that is real and present, rushing airily along shocking, unlighted and fear-haunted abysses, and occasionally tearing through certain well-marked and typical obstacles describable only as viscous, uncouth clouds or vapors. In these black and bodiless flights, we were sometimes alone and sometimes together. When we were together, my friend was always far ahead. I could comprehend his presence, despite the absence of form by a species of pictorial memory whereby his face appeared to me, golden from a strange light and frightful with its weird beauty, its anomalously youthful cheeks, its burning eyes, its Olympian brow, and its shadowing hair and growth of beard. Of the progress of time we kept no record, for time had become to us the merest illusion. I know only that there must have been something very singular involved, since we came at length to marvel why we did not grow old. Our discourse was unholy and always hideously ambitious. No god or demon could have aspired to discoveries and conquests like those which we planned in whispers. I shiver as I speak of them, and dare not be explicit. Though I will say that my friend once wrote not paper wish which he dared not utter with his tongue, and which made me burn the paper and look affrightedly out of the window at the spangled night sky, I will hint, only hint, that he had designs which involved the rulership of the visible universe and more, designs whereby the earth and the stars would move at his command, and the destinies of all living things be his. 
I affirm, I swear, that I had no share in these extreme aspirations. Anything my friend may have said or written to the contrary must be erroneous, for I am no man of strength to risk the unmentionable warfare and unmentionable spheres by which alone one might achieve success. There was a night when winds from unknown spaces whirled us irresistibly into limitless vacua beyond all thought and entity. Perceptions of the most maddeningly untransmissible sort thronged upon us, perceptions of infinity, which at the time convulsed us with joy, yet which are now partly lost to my memory and partly incapable of presentation to others. Viscous obstacles were clawed through in rapid succession, and at length I felt that we had been born to realms of greater remoteness than any we had previously known. My friend was vastly in advance as we plunged into this awesome ocean of virgin ether, and I could see the sinister exultation on his floating luminous, too youthful memory face. Suddenly, that face became dim and quickly disappeared, and in a brief space I found myself projected against an obstacle which I could not penetrate. It was like the others, yet incalculably denser, a sticky, clammy mass, if such terms can be applied to analogous qualities in a non-material sphere. I had, I felt, been halted by a barrier which my friend and leader had successfully passed. Struggling anew, I came to the end of the drug dream and opened my physical eyes to the tower studio, in whose opposite corner reclined the pallid and still unconscious form of my fellow dreamer, weirdly haggard and wildly beautiful as the moon shed gold's green light on his marble features. Then, after a short interval, the form in the corner stirred. May pitying heaven keep from my sight and sound another thing like that which took place before me. I cannot tell you how he shrieked, or what vistas of invisible hells gleamed for a second in black eyes crazed with fright. I can only say that I fainted and did not stir till he himself recovered and shook me in his frenzy for someone to keep away the horror and desolation. That was the end of our voluntary searchings in the caverns of dream. Awed, shaken, and portentous, my friend, who had been beyond the barrier, warned me that we must never venture within those realms again. What he had seen, he dared not tell me, but he said from his wisdom that we must sleep as little as possible, even if drugs were necessary to keep us awake. And that he was right. I soon learned from the unutterable fear which engulfed me whenever consciousness lapsed. After each sort and inevitable sleep, I seemed older, whilst my friend aged with the rapidity almost shocking. It is hideous to see wrinkles form and hair whiten almost before one's eyes. Our mode of life was now totally altered. Heretofore, a recluse, so far as I know, his true name and origin never having passed his lips, my friend now became frantic in his fear of solitude. At night, he would not be alone, nor would the company of a few persons calm him. His sole relief was obtained in revelry of the most general and boisterous sort, so that few assemblies of the young and the gay were known to, unknown to us. Our appearance and age seemed to excite, in most cases, a ridicule which I keenly resented, but which my friend considered a lesser evil than solitude. Especially was he afraid to be out of doors alone when the stars were shining, and enforced to this condition he would often glance furtively at the sky as it haunted, as if haunted by some monstrous thing therein. He did not always glance at the same place in the sky. It seemed to be a different place at different times. On spring evenings, it would be low in the northeast. In the summer, it would be nearly overhead. In the autumn, it would be in the northwest. In winter, it would be in the east, but mostly if in the small hours of morning. In winter, evenings seemed least dreadful to him. Only after two years did I connect this fear with anything in particular. But then I began to see that he must be looking at a special spot on the celestial vault whose position at different times corresponded to the direction of his glance, a spot roughly marked by the constellation Corona Borealis. We now had a studio in London, 
never separating, but never discussing the days when we had sought to plumb the mysteries of the unreal world. We were aged and weak from our drugs, dissipations, and nervous overstrain, and the thinning hair and beard of my friend had become snow white. Our freedom from long sleep was surprising, for seldom did we succumb more than an hour or two at the time to the shadow which had now grown so frightful a menace. Then came one January of fog and rain, when money ran low and drugs were hard to buy. My statues and ivory heads were all sold, and I had no means to purchase new materials or energy to fashion them even had I possessed them. We suffered terribly, and on a certain night my friend sank into a deep breathing sleep from which I could not awaken him. I can recall the scene now, the desolate, pitch black garret studio under the eaves with the rain beating down, the ticking of the lone clock the fancied ticking of our watches as they rested on the dressing table, the creaking of some swaying shutter in a remote part of the house, certain distant city noises muffled by fog and space, and worst of all, the deep, steady, sinister breathing of my friend on the couch, a rhythmical breathing which seemed to measure moments of supernal fear and agony for his spirit as it wandered in spheres forbidden, unimagined, and hideously remote. The tension of my vigil became oppressive, and a wild train of trivial impressions and association thronged through my almost unhinged mind. I heard a clock strike somewhere, not ours, for that was not a striking clock, and my morbid fancy found in this a new starting point for idle wanderings. Clocks, time, space, infinity, and then my fancy reverted to the local as I reflected that even now, Beyond the roof and the fog and the rain and the atmosphere, Corona Borealis was rising in the northeast. Corona Borealis, which my friend had appeared to dread, and whose scintillant semicircle of stars must even now be glowing unseen through the measureless abysses of ether. All at once, my feverishly sensitive ears seemed to detect a new and wholly distinct component in the soft medley of drug-magnified sounds a low and damnably insistent whine from very far away, droning, clamoring, mocking, calling from the northeast. But it was not that distant whine which robbed me of my faculties and set upon my soul such a seal of fright as may never in life be removed, not that which drew the shrieks and excited, cited the convulsions which caused lodgers and police to break down the door. It was not what I heard. But what I saw, for in that dark, locked, shuttered, and curtained room from there appeared the black northeast corner, a shaft of horrible red-gold light, a shaft which bore with it no glow to disperse the darkness, but which streamed only upon the recumbent head of the troubled sleeper, bringing out in hideous duplication the luminous and strangely youthful memory face as I had known it in dreams of abysmal space and unshackled time, when my friend had pushed behind the barrier to those secret innermost and forbidden caverns of nightmare. And as I looked, I beheld the head rise, the black, liquid, and deep sunken eyes open in terror, and the thin, shadowed lips part as if for a scream too frightful to be uttered. There dwelt in that ghastly, inflexible face, as it shone bodiless, luminous, and rejuvenated in the blackness, more of stark, teeming, rain-shattering fear than all the rest of heaven and earth has ever revealed to me. No word was spoken amidst the distant sound that grew nearer and nearer. But as I followed the memory face's mad stare along that cursed shaft of life to its light to its source, the source whence also the whining came, I too saw for an instant what it saw, and fell with ringing ears in that fit of shrieking and epilepsy which brought the lodgers and the police. Never could I tell, try as I might, what it actually was that I saw, nor could the still face tell. For although it must have seen more than I did, it will never speak again. But always I shall guard against the mocking and insatiate hypnose, the lord of sleep, against the night sky, and against the mad ambitions of knowledge and philosophy. 
Just what happened is unknown, for not only was my mind unseated by the strange and hideous thing, but others were tainted with a forgetfulness which can mean nothing, if not madness. They have said, I know not for what reason, that I never had a friend, that art, philosophy, and insanity had filled all my tragic life. The lodgers and police on that night soothed me, and the doctor administered something to quiet me, nor did anyone see what a nightmare event had taken place. My stricken friend moved them to no pity, but what they found on the couch in the studio made them give me a praise which sickened me, and now a fame which I spurn in despair as I sit for hours bald, grey-bearded, shriveled, palsied, drug-crazed and broken, adoring and praying to the object they found. For they deny that I sold the last of my statuary, and point with ecstasy at the thing which the shining light of left cold, petrified, and unvocal. It is all that remains of my friend, the friend who led me on to madness and wreckage, a godlike head of such marble as only old Hellas could yield, young with the youth that is outside time, and with beauteous bearded face, curved smiling lips, Olympian brow, and dense locks waving and poppy crowned. They say that that haunting memory face was modeled from my own, as it was at twenty-five, but upon the marble base is carven a single name in the letters of Attica, Hypnos.